Amen. Y'all let them know how much you appreciate them leading us this morning in worship. And uh, so blessed by them, uh, many of them. I actually spend all three services with us on Sunday morning, so we're very blessed for their sacrifice to lead us. Have you got a Bible with you? Say, yeah. All right, so go ahead and open it up. Mark chapter 14 is where we find ourselves this morning. I did miss you last Sunday. Obviously, I was out and uh, with my wife. I'll share a little bit about that uh, as the message goes along. But this morning, I want to continue the series entitled Resolved, all right? We're talking about resolutions for a disciple's life. There are 31 of them. There's actually a Kindle book that you can download for free today if you want to grab hold of that with all 31 of those particular devotionals there that will help you. But this morning, I want to begin basically by asking you a pretty simple question, all right? So let's pretend for just a moment uh, that I actually show up to your house. And so I come in and I sit down with you in your living room, and uh, we're sipping on some coffee, and then I basically ask you this question, okay? I say, uh, tell me seriously. This is when it get real. It just got real, didn't it? Uh, tell me seriously, how, how, are you, how are you doing spiritually? I mean, like, where are you? Uh, if you had to maybe scale it one to ten, I mean, one being... You're further away from God now than you've ever been. Ten is like you're as close to God as you've ever been. I mean, where would you, where would you put it? Uh, how, how do you feel like? You feel like you're growing more like Jesus? Or maybe you're just kind of stagnant, kind of just, you know, pushing through. Now, how would you respond to that particular question? You know, I've, a, I've had that question asked to me before. And I think it's a great question. The only thing that's aggravating to me about the question is that it's difficult to come up with an objective, quantitative way to give an answer to that. In other words, a lot of times it's just based upon our feelings. It's like however we feel that particular day. But when you think about uh, measuring success or even process in our current culture, I mean, pretty much everything has an objective way to figure it out. I mean, example, all right, if you're in sales, you know you're being successful if you have more sales next month, or this month rather, than you did the month previous. Or if you're a professional baseball player, you know you're doing awesome if your batting average is going up. But if your batting average goes down in a particular month, what do they call that? They call it a slump. So there's no progress happening. But those are objective ways. And then if you think about uh, the fact that if you want to lose weight, I mean, there's one of these things, right? Anybody want to stand on it this morning? All right. No. Chill out. All right. Chill. But that's it, right? So we have this, like, okay, so it's like, I'm going to lose weight, so I'm going to work out, I'm going to eat right, and then at least at the end of the week or whatever, I'm going to stand on the scale, and there's an objective, quantitative way to tell you whether or not you are being successful or whether or not you're a miserable failure like the week previous. That was a joke. But anyway, so, but that's the deal. Y'all still with me say yes? All right, good deal, good deal. So what, what if this morning uh, I could tell you that there is a way for you to objectively determine how you're doing spiritually. In fact, what I want to do this morning is talk to you about a scale that you can stand on spiritually that will give you an indication of whether or not uh, you're growing in your relationship with Jesus, getting closer to Him, or whether or not you're actually falling away from Him. That is, you're not growing, you're not experiencing success or progress. So I'm going to share uh, share that with you rather this morning. So let me give it to you in a mathematical equation, all right? You need to jot this one down because this is going to help you. And I tell you it's going to help you knowing that it has already helped me uh, over the past few weeks, all right? So I'm going to give you the equation, and then I'll talk to you about how it bears itself out in Mark chapter 14. But here it is. Y'all ready for it? Say yes. All right, so first of all, jot this down. Uh, You have in your life adversity plus your emotions equals your true leader in life. Adversity plus your emotions equals your true leader in life. We're going to see how that bears itself out and how I found that was in Mark chapter 14. So let me set the scene for you before we read our verse of Scripture this morning. The scene is pretty simple, all right? Jesus is going to the Garden of Gethsemane with his disciples. Now, if you grew up in church, you know what's going down. Jesus is in the shadow of the cross right now. In the Gospel of John, what you have going on is Jesus always saying, my hour has not yet come, my hour has not yet come. But this particular time frame in the life and ministry of Jesus is evidence that his hour is indeed approaching and approaching extremely quickly. And so Jesus, he's about to be crucified. He's about to go to the cross at Calvary and experience adversity like he's never experienced it before in his entire life. And that adversity would be Jesus hanging on the cross, bearing the weight of God's wrath in his own body against the sins of all of those who've ever breathed the breath of life. 
So Jesus is going to die, he's going to be buried, he's going to be raised again. But this is a massive, massive uh, time of trial in his life. So what does Jesus do? He tells his disciples, right? He says, all right, guys, I'm going to go up here and I'm going to pray. I want you, just, you, you do the same thing. Are y'all, y'all following me now? So he says, uh, disciples, you pray, I'm going to go up here and pray, and I'll come back and I'll check on you. So Jesus goes up and he prays. Uh, he comes back in about an hour. You know what the disciples were doing? Yeah, they were taking a nap, right? They said, we're sleeping. So like, yeah, she's like some of you guys do when I preach, right? So you're like, I'm just praying for you, preacher. No, you're not. You're sleeping. You're a liar. But anyway, so, so that's what these disciples are doing. They fall asleep. So Jesus comes over. He's like, hey, man, get up. And, uh, you know, this is my paraphrase. You with me? But he, he's like, uh, you couldn't hang out with me and pray for one hour? I mean, uh, listen, you've got to get So then he goes back and he prays. He tells them. He leaves them again. So he goes back this time, and as he's praying, he falls in on his knees. And this is a uh, time of distress in the life of Jesus, time of great adversity. So he's praying, and he says, Father, uh, Abba. And he, he calls him Abba, which is an awesome term of endearment. It literally means daddy. So he's saying, Jesus to God, the Father, he says, Daddy. Uh, everything, and this is, this is, just imagine this prayer. Every single thing is possible with you. So if it is possible, please let this cup pass from me. Now, whenever he says this cup pass from me, in the New Testament, what he's talking about is the cup of suffering. It's the cup of God's wrath. So he says, hey, uh, everything's possible, so could you please let this cup pass from me? But then Jesus says this, but nevertheless, not my will be done, but your will be done. In other words, not my plan and purpose in life, but your plan and purpose in life. So you can see he's praying, and this is a time of great distress. So he gets up from that prayer. He goes back uh, to his disciples. Which he, he just woke up a little while ago, right? And he goes back and he, because he left them again to pray. So he finds them, and, and you know what they're doing this time? Yeah, they're sleeping. You know what I mean? Now, if I were Jesus, I'd have just struck them all dead. You with me, right? I'd have just been like, Bzz. don't act spiritual like you wouldn't have, all right? You know you would have. Y'all looking at me like, y'all like this guy's the preacher? Yeah. <laughs> But anyway, so, so here they are, and he's like, no, get up, get up. And then he, then he kind of singles uh, Peter out, Simon Peter, and he says, Simon, you got to get up. you gotta, you got to pray. You, I, I can't believe you couldn't do this for one hour with me. And then he says, you need to pray because temptation is about to hit. And then he makes this statement to him. He says, your spirit is willing, but your flesh is weak. Now notice that phrase right there, your spirit is willing, your flesh is weak. It really compartmentalizes something for Peter in his life. First of all, he has a spirit. Now, the Spirit here is not the Holy Spirit, but this is actually talking about the inward man. It talks about his uh, inward disposition. It could even uh, characterize his good intention. So his spirit is willing, but his flesh is weak. Now, his flesh here is actually discussing his humanness, his inadequacies. Which, by the way, just so everybody's on the same page, the Holy Spirit is not who is being talked about in Mark chapter 14 when Jesus says, your spirit is willing. The reason he's not talking about the Holy Spirit is because the Holy Spirit has not yet taken up residence in the life of believers. That doesn't happen until after the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, whenever the church is birthed. Then you have Acts chapter 2, the Spirit of God taking up residence in the lives of those who are followers of Jesus. That's why Jesus says to his disciples on one occasion in John 16, he says it like this. He says, guys, it's going to be better when I leave because whenever I leave, then I'll be able to send the Holy Spirit. And he will help you. He will guide you into the truth. So when Jesus says your spirit is willing, he's talking about Peter's good intentions, but not the Holy Spirit at this moment. But your flesh is weak. And he's about to face the equation that I've already given you. Adversity comes. Matter of fact, if you think about the text, they could hear adversity. They could hear as uh, many foots, foots, Many feet. Y'all with me say amen? <laughs> Many feet were hammering on the ground. They could feel the vibrations even in their own bodies as they sat there on the ground. And then they would sit up because they knew someone was coming. They knew there was a crowd coming. And they could hear swords being drawn. They could hear clubs hitting against one another. They could hear chains uh, even uh, making that sound as they hit against one another as well. And then they could see it, right? They could see uh, the torches lighting up the night sky. They grow closer, grow louder. And then the one who is on the front of that mob that's bum-rushing where Jesus and the disciples are, the one on the front is Judas. If you don't know Judas, Judas used to be one of the followers of Jesus. But now he is a betrayer of Jesus. He is turning Jesus over to the high priest and the chief priest of that day so that he can be falsely accused, tried, and then crucified. So Judas now is betrayed, and he comes out leading the mob. And check this out. 
he betrays him by turning a term of endearment into what we now know is a term of betrayal. He greets Jesus with a kiss. And that was very normal back in the day when you had a disciple and a rabbi. A disciple would show respect to the rabbi by coming to him and greet him with a kiss. That was very normal in their culture. Kiss on the cheek. I've been overseas where that's normal as well in their culture. It's not normal to me. Especially when the man kissed me who had a mustache. I was like, bro. I ain't lying either, man. I was like, don't ever do that again. It was in Kenya. Anyway, so here, here it is, the betrayal. Now they are going to go and arrest Jesus. Now this is also, this is amazing. This is a time in the life of the disciples, disciples of trial that they have never faced before. So how do they respond? Because you have it. Adversity plus emotions is going to give credence to who your true leader is in the moment of the adversity. So let's see uh, how one of them responds. Y'all ready for it? Say yeah. All right, so stand with me in honor of God's word. Mark chapter 14, verse 47. You got that in your Bible? Say yes. But one of those who stood by drew his sword. And look, look at me real quick. This is pretty wild, okay? Because it... This text in Mark chapter 14 doesn't tell us who the one is that drew a sword. You know what's interesting? Matthew doesn't tell us either. Neither does Luke tell us. But you know who tells us? John does. John doesn't care. And if you read the, and I'm telling you this, this is just trying to, this is just free information. If you read the Gospel of John, you know what you'll discover? You'll discover that apparently John and Peter had some sort of like rivalry going on. Now, this is no joke. Even when they went to the empty tomb, you know what and John wrote the Gospel of John? You know what John said? John said, the beloved disciple and Peter <laughs> ran, that, this, is no, this is in our Bible, ran to the tomb. And then check this out. But the other disciple was there first. <laughs> Do you know what John was saying? He's like, I outran him. That's what he said, right? And then he even says, and whenever we looked into the empty tomb, he said it like this. And the other disciple, John referring to himself, saw it first. It's like, chill out, bro. <laughs> and like, no kidding, even whenever John writes about P, uh, uh, Andrew, he says, uh, that's Andrew, that's, oh, that's, that's Peter's brother. So whenever John writes about this event, although Matthew, Mark, and Luke don't refer to who the person is, John's like, it was Peter. I don't care. <laughs> Call him out. Y'all didn't know that was in the Bible. You're going to go read it now, aren't you? All right, so now, verse 47. But one of those who stood by drew his sword and struck the slave of the high priest and cut off his ear. And Jesus said to them, Have you come out with me with swords and clubs to arrest me as you would against a robber? Every day I was with you in the temple teaching, and you did not seize me. But this has taken place to fulfill the scriptures, and they all left him and fled. And then I'm going to give you verse 51 as well as uh, 52. And before I read it, look at me eyeball to eyeball. That's what I want to tell you about 51 and 52 of Mark 14. If you can find out who this is talking about, would you please call me? Send me a text. I've never heard these two verses preached on or talked about, and I can't find anything of substance about these two verses. Y'all ready to read them now? <laughs> 51. A young man was following him wearing nothing but a linen sheet over his naked body and they seized him but he pulled free of the linen sheet and escaped naked. That's all we have about that cat. <laughs> that's crazy though, isn't it? Apparently, I mean, there's a dude running the countryside naked. And that's all, and I don't even know that's why, I don't even know that's I don't know why it's in the Bible. I don't even know why it's there. Because you keep reading, that naked dude never comes back around. <laughs> right? So all we know, he's in heaven now. And Lord willing, he's got clothes now. Can I get a witness on that? Isn't that the craziest thing? Like, I, I kid you not, 51 and 52 in my Bible, look at that. I got a big old question mark there. Y'all see that? Because my question was, who is that naked guy? <laughs> now, I'm not preaching on him, okay? <laughs> Somebody said, oh, I'm going to preach on Peter. All right. So let's bow together. Father, we do thank you so much for your word and ask that you would help us to see um, how you desire to grow us uh, through adversity. And God, we see it in Peter's life, and Lord, I'm confident we'll also see it in each one of our lives as we walk uh, through this 
concept in Mark chapter 14. And we give you glory for it. And it's in Jesus Christ's name that we pray. And everybody said, amen, amen, amen. So you go ahead and be seated for just a second. All right, so let me, let's set it up for you real quick, okay? So you've got adversity in Peter's life like he's never experienced before in this particular text. So adversity now added to his emotions. What were the emotions that Peter had in this moment? The emotions were pretty simple, all right? Apparently, uh, he was angry. Apparently, he thought things were getting outside of his control. Uh, maybe even some resentment toward Judas, who had just betrayed Jesus right in front of everybody's face. And so what does Peter do? He draws a sword because your emotions always lead to reactions. And then he reacts by cutting uh, the slave's ear off. Uh, one commentator said he tried to uh, uh, fight a spiritual battle using physical weapons. Never do it. And then he said, if Jesus had not healed that man's ear on that day, Peter would have been arrested too, and there most likely would have not just been three crosses, there would have been four crosses. That is, Peter would have been put to death because of his crime. But what's crazy here is you have this emotion which gives evidence to who his true leader was in the moment of that adversity. Now remember Jesus says to him prior to this, your spirit is willing, but your flesh is weak. So he has the adversity, his emotions show up. So who's leading him? It's very clear. It's his flesh. His flesh, his old way of thinking and living, his humanness, his inadequacies are actually determining his inward disposition, which give rise to his outward expression of anger and cutting off the slave's ear. Now with that in mind, what we're going to see this morning is that that is the scale when you face adversity and I face adversity, we are standing on the scale, and that scale gives evidence of our inward emotions. And whatever our inward emotions are, it determines who our true leader is in the moment of that particular adversity. So I'm going to give you two statements about adversity this morning. Jot these down very quickly. Adversity always spotlights my emotions. Adversity always spotlights my emotions. Now, adversity, uh, you know what it is. It's a hardship, a distress, a suffering, or pain that comes into our lives. Adversity can show up whenever we um, uh, say stuff like this. We're like, well, I didn't have that planned. I mean, that wasn't on the schedule. That is outside of what we were looking forward to accomplish. So that can be an adversity. Adversity also uh, can be experienced whenever we have a failure in life. Some of you may be experiencing that now. Maybe you've got a failure at work or maybe even a failure at home or even a failure in your marriage. And so that's adversity in your life. Then adversity is present when we experience a loss. So someone uh, loses a loved one. That's adversity. Uh, someone may lose a job, may lose a promotion. That is adversity. Adversity is also present when we experience a change in life. So maybe you think about a middle schooler or a high schooler. They have a change uh, in one school to another school. That is adversity in the life of that teenager. That's a change, and change often brings adversity. Now, the amazing thing about adversity is that adversity shows up with this spotlight. And adversity always puts a spotlight on our emotions, on our inward disposition. And uh, the Bible actually talks about uh, some emotions that we can have whenever our flesh is in control. Now listen to some of these emotions. I'm just going to list some of these for you. But you can have uh, hatred. You can have the emotion of anger or resentment. I mean, you think about how that works out, right? So if you have a married couple and let's say a husband is ill at his wife for whatever reason, there's adversity facing that marriage, and the husband becomes resentful and angry, well, that, that's, a, that's an emotion which leads to responses that do not glorify the Lord. So anyway, those are emotions. Then you've got alienation. You've got laziness. You have fear, anxiety, worry, panic. Uh, think about uh, maybe somebody who's experiencing um, some sort of trial in their finances. And so as a result, they become overwhelmingly fearful. They start, you know, like thinking things are outside of their control. It's very similar to how Peter felt in that particular text in Mark chapter 14. Then you have sadness, negativity, you can even have uh, depression. And then you've got uh, a rise from these emotions of reactions. Listen to some of these that I found in the scripture, okay? There's uh, unruly disagreements, uh, there's agitation, there's judgmentalism, revengeful plans, animosity, dishonesty, disloyalty, slander, abusive speech, outburst of anger or simply just being out of control. All of these are, check this out, actions that are followed by the emotions that we possess from the onset. But what is it that brought about the emotion? 
Well, it was the adversity which we faced. So the adversity plus the emotion equals who our true leader in this life is, especially in the moment of that particular adversity. Just as Peter said, or heard Jesus say to him, uh, your spirit is willing, your flesh is weak. There's a compartmental uh, concept that you got to pick up on right now. Okay, so if you miss this, you'll miss the whole message, okay? So is everybody paying attention? Hit your neighbor and tell him he's, he's fixing to say something good here. All right, hit him. Hit him real hard. Y'all are just like Baptists. Some of y'all are like, I'm not hitting my neighbor. <laughs> we don't do that. We're Baptists. All right, so check it out. Okay, so here's the deal. Uh, when you come to faith in Jesus, the Bible says the Holy Spirit takes up residence in your heart. Right? So that happens the moment of salvation. We, unlike Peter, are living post uh, resurrection. So we're after the resurrection. So as soon as you come to faith in Jesus, the Holy Spirit takes up residence in your life. So now you, as a follower of Christ, as a disciple, have a brand new leader. And the Holy Spirit actually guides you into the truth. And the Holy Spirit actually leads you to respond, check this out, to adversity in such a way that it gives glory to God the Father. So this is what the Holy Spirit does. So you have the Spirit of God residing within you if you know Jesus personally. And the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 5 that we should be filled with the Holy Spirit. In fact, it says don't get drunk with wine. That's dissipation. In other words, that's a waste. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. So in the same way a person who is drunk is affected in every single sense of their life, so is a person who is filled with the Holy Spirit. They are affected by, they see things differently, they hear things differently, they walk differently. Their life is different, they speak different. Right? That's the Spirit of God taking up residence and then controlling the individual as we surrender to Him. Now what's interesting here is that the Bible actually says that the Spirit of God empowers us to take off, check this out, old emotions which we used to have whenever we faced adversity. In fact, in Colossians 3, it says it like this. And Paul is actually using terminology of taking off old clothes and putting on new clothes. But in Colossians 3 and verse 8, he says it like this. Listen, this is an awesome verse. He says, hey, take all of these off. And you can kind of imagine. These are the clothes, right? Take off uh, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and abusive speech. Get rid of those things. And then he says this in Colossians chapter 3. Here's what you need to now put on. In other words, as soon as you came to faith in Jesus, the Holy Spirit moved into your life, but he also brought this massive wardrobe with him. So he says, here's the, here are the clothes you can put on now because the Spirit of God is going to help you do that. Put on compassion. Put on patience. Put on kindness. Put on love. Put on joy. All of these are given to us by the Holy Spirit. So how do we know What's going down with our emotions? We know what's going down with our emotions whenever we face adversity in our life. And whenever we face adversity in our life, that is when you and I begin to sense this uh, struggle deep on the inside of our lives. And that struggle is between, check this out, the Holy Spirit and our flesh. The Spirit of God, who is now our new manager, and our flesh, our old way of thinking and living, are in opposition to one another. In fact, the Bible says in Romans chapter 8 and verse 8, that you, check this out, you cannot please God in the flesh. So whenever you stand on the scale of adversity and you find th that you have fleshly emotions, that is, maybe anger, maybe fear, maybe anxiety, maybe worry, maybe you're overwhelmed with pain. When you have those fleshly emotions, check this out, it is an impossibility for you in that moment to please the Lord. Matter of fact, the Bible says in Galatians chapter uh, 5, and let me read this verse to you because this is awesome. And it says, For the Spirit uh, sets its desire against the flesh, and the flesh against the Spirit. For these are in opposition to one another, so that you may not do the things that you please. Now, check this out. This is what's awesome. Check, y'all with me? Come here, come here. Eyeball to eyeball. Here's what um, uh, Paul is saying. He's saying this. He's saying, Look, you're going to face adversity in this life, but if you're a follower of Jesus, all right, everybody, come here, come here. Here's what he's saying you can't just do whatever you want to do. Yeah. Are y'all? In other words, you can't, just because you feel like acting, you cannot do that anymore. You have a new leader. It's the Spirit of God who resides within you. So don't allow your flesh to tell you what to do. But it's amazing how adversity in our life brings a huge spotlight to these emotions that we experience. In fact, whenever we experience uh, these difficulties, we have to make sure that we don't have a quick Peter reaction, like Mark 14. 
start trying to slice and dice people. Are y'all listening? Now, this is how it rolls out, okay? So, a few weeks ago, adversity has hit the Skipper family. Uh, Skipper's my last name. You know with me? So, we've, we've had a scale that we've had to stand on, which has kind of given, given me an indication, given us an indication of where we are spiritually, whether or not we're growing, whether or not we're becoming more like Jesus or whatever. And so, let me set, set it up for you, okay? So, a few weeks ago, we were at, a, um, at an event. We were helping raise funds for a, uh, an organization. So, while we were there, uh, we were eating, and Krista was, Krista's my wife. Everybody with me on who, who? Skipper's my last name. Krista's my wife. All right, so anyway, she's having a hard time swallowing. She's like, I don't know what the deal is, but I can't always swallow. So anyway, I said, well, that's, you know, that's not good. Swallowing's pretty important. So why don't we go to the house? We'll chill out, you know what I mean, and hopefully be better tomorrow. So we get up the next day. She's like, yeah, I'm better. I feel better. I mean, I, it feels a little bit awkward, but I, I'm okay. So anyway, uh, time goes by, and then one Saturday we're hanging out. And uh, Saturday morning, we did some stuff with the kids, I believe. And that afternoon, she said, uh, I need to go to the ER. This is on Saturday. ER means emergency room. So I, I said, really? What's the, I mean, what's the deal? She's like, I can't swallow. Like, I literally have not been able to swallow, and something's wrong, right? And she, by the way, she's not ate solid foods for a while. She's been just kind of sipping on uh, some water and soup or whatever. And so, uh, and when she says she's got to go to the ER, I mean, it's, it's a pretty serious deal, right? Because my wife is a tough woman. She's had four kids all by herself. You know what I'm saying? I mean, I was in the room, but she did most of the heavy lifting. You know what I mean? So, uh, so when she says she's not like, I was like, all right, well, let's go. So we hop in the truck. We go to the ER. We get there, and um, they try to assess what's going down with her. And they say, uh, we think you're just, you know, having like an anxiety attack. And uh, Krista's like, yeah, but I'm not. I mean, I'm perfectly fine. I'm really not having it. I don't, I'm not. So anyway, they kind of talk. They come back in with the doctor, and the doctors prescribe some medicine. Uh, the end of what they said she had was uh, something, something, hysteria. <laughs> so I'm like looking at my wife like, <laughs> I'm just kidding. But anyway, so we're there, and uh, we go and get it uh, filled, and uh, she's, she's telling me. She's like, I, but I'm not, I'm not anxious. I feel fine. I'm just telling you I have a problem swallowing. But uh, I'll tell you this much, man, that medicine's helped me. Can I get a witness on that? But anyway, so, <laughs> so we, get to the, we get to the house, you know, we find, we set up in a doctor's appointment. Well, uh, come to find out she, she's not having some kind of hysterical uh, situation. She's actually got a thyroid situation. So they say, we need to take out half your thyroid because that half has a nodule on it. That's what's growing. That's what's keeping you from being able to swallow. So they schedule the surgery. We have half of it taken out. And that was on a Monday. And then on a Thursday following, they call her and say, we biopsied it. It's got cancer. We've got to get the rest of it out. So then they schedule it, the, the surgery for the next day, next Friday. And, um, and so she goes back in. She has the other portion taken out. And so now she's at the house. Obviously, this is kind of a big, big ordeal in a short amount of time. So she's at the house. She's weak. I'm taking care of her. So last Sunday, while you guys were all here having fun, I was at the house, you know, watching my wife. And she's on the uh, couch. And while she's on the couch, what was kind of crazy is... Uh, and I'll tell you this, before we got to the couch, she was talking about how her arms were asleep and her legs were asleep and she wasn't doing well. And so, so uh, I, I told her, I said, well, let's get up and walk around. You know, you need some circulation. I mean, I've, I've, my arm has fallen asleep many times, right? Let's move that thing around. Let's do some jumping jacks, girl. What are you doing? <laughs> so they always start moving around. She's like, that's not helping. I'm like, well, you need to get it. Let, let, let's run a hot bath. I run you a hot bath. You get in a bath and you get some heat, you know, on your body. That'll open up your veins. Uh, I'm a doctor. So I, I shared that with her which I am, but anyway, she's just not that kind. So anyway, so, so she gets out. That's not working. She's on the couch. She's like, my back's falling asleep. So I end up calling a buddy of mine who has, you know, the ability to take your blood pressure and check your pulse, and he comes over. He looks at her, and um, it gets worse. Her blood pressure's fine. Her pulse is fine. And then all of a sudden, um, like literally, her arms start drawing up, her hands draw up like this really bad, and pull up real close to her face, and she can't move them. And then her legs begin to draw up, her back is kind of uh, crooked a little bit, and she's just looking all kinds of messed up laying there. And then she says, I can feel it, it's coming on my head. You gotta, you gotta get somebody. So we call 911, and in the moment, uh, while 911 is being called by my buddy, uh, I can see literally, I mean, it's, it's just going down her face. So her eyes go shut. She's unable to open them. Uh, her jaw begins to clench shut, and she's unable to open her mouth anymore. And uh, she's um, trying to talk to me through her teeth, but basically uh, can't hardly say anything. And, and you can imagine, right, if all your muscles now are cramping, uh, what do you begin to think, especially if it starts from your head and you feel it going down? It's like, oh, wait a minute, my heart's a muscle. 
right? So this gets serious real quick. So 911, it's like, get them over here. They, they pick her up. She can't even straighten out. They can't even get her finger out to put one of those little things on it, check your pulse, right? Because they, that's how locked down she was. So they put her on the little, you know, stretcher. They put her in the back of the thing. I'm riding up front with this cat uh, down to the emergency room. And while we're riding down there, um, you know, I'm, I, can I tell you this? I was on the scale of adversity. Now, I know my wife was too, but I'll let her talk later. But I was, you know what I'm saying? Can I tell you what my emotion was in that moment? Total peace. I mean, I was late. I was cool as a cucumber. I have no, except to say it was the Holy Spirit. That's the only answer I can give you, right? But we get down, they unload my wife in the ER, get in there, a guy sees her and says she has calcium, I call it calcium withdrawals or something, you know, shock. Calcium crazies, you know what I mean? I'm a doctor. I can call it whatever I want to call it, right? So they give her some calcium, and then about 30 minutes later, her fingers lighten up, her arms lighten up, her legs go back normal. She's talking, her, her eyes are open. I mean, everything looks normal. And then, uh, then I started freaking out. <laughs> are y'all listening to what I'm saying? So now I'm still on the same scale, and I was doing, I mean, I was doing well. But there's something about being at the ER. They put you in them little cages. And I'm, you know what I mean? I'm looking at my wife, and I'm like walking around like, basically like this. But it's as far as I can get because this is how big the cage is. You know what I mean? And I'm thinking to myself, oh, my word. And the last thing she said to me was, uh, Levi, I'm about to die. So I'm, all of a sudden now that starts playing in my mind. And I have to leave. I have to walk out of the curtain, you know. And uh, I, I'm, I go down, I get a Coke. I try to drink a Coke, chill myself out. Because <laughs> Coke does that to me. But anyway, so I... And then I'm, I'm walking back. I'm in the bathroom by myself, and I'm like, I got to breathe, man. I, gotta, I feel like my arms are going to sleep now. What is, you know what I mean? I mean, that's how I felt, you know. And literally, I go back in the room, and, and Chris is like, laid back. She's doing much better now, you know. And, you know, and, I, and I'm sitting there, and, I'm, and she's like, you okay? I'm like, hold on a second. And I'm taking my phone out because I got this little thing that counts my pulse for me. I'm like, hold on just a second. I'm like, I got my pulse. I know you got issues, but right now, <laughs> I mean, I'm my heart. I can feel my heart beating. 124, that thing was beating. That's rapid. If you don't know nothing about rapid, that's rapid, all right? So that's how I felt, right? I know my wife has got issues, but I got some issues at this point. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I love her. Y'all with me? But what's crazy is the reason I tell you that is because the entire time, this whole message is in my mind. Because this, this message has been done for two and a half weeks. So I've been sitting on it. And I'm thinking, oh, my word, here it is. Some adversity comes. Now I'm looking at my emotions. How am I doing? It gives evidence. And I, I'll tell you this. When we were riding down, great evidence. Who was controlling my emotions? The Holy Spirit. But somewhere in that emergency room, I decided to surrender to my own anxiety, my own flesh. And what it gave, it gave evidence, right? I was on it, my emotions. Now I'm freaking out. Now I'm like, you know. <laughs> Fred Sanford, y'all remember him? Y'all remember Fred Sanford? I'm coming to see you. All right. I don't know why I thought of Fred Sanford. That was crazy, wasn't it? But that's how I felt, right? But what does that give evidence? It gives evidence now all of a sudden. Um, my flesh is controlling my emotions. Now, isn't that crazy? Because uh, the adversity that you face in life, the adversity of faith, it always spotlights our emotions. And it gives evidence of who our true leader is. Which also leads me to the second statement. And that is adversity actually shows your spiritual development. You got, you, y'all got to jot that one down. Jot it down because that's uh, really point number two. Adversity reveals my spiritual development. Uh, think about a two-year-old at Walmart who doesn't get his way. What does he do? He throws himself on the floor. He screams. He cries. He hollers, right? And then you're there and you're like, if that were my kid, here's what I would do. Right? Y'all have ever said this before? Tell you what, if that was my kid, I'd, I would now spank him. And then I'm like... If I was my kid, I wouldn't feed him for a week. You know what I'm saying? That's, we serious at the skippers. But, it, but you get my point, right? You see the issue? Now, that's, they're two. That's how a two-year-old's supposed to act. But when you're 35, 45, 55, 65, 75, 85, and you're a follower of Jesus and things don't go your way, and you still act like that? No, no, no. I don't mean that you're throwing yourself on the floor and kicking and screaming, but some of you go nuts. And things get a little out of whack at home. Things get a little out of whack at work. And anxiety blows you up. And all of a sudden, resentment and anger may surface. What do you do? Out of those emotions, you react. And how do you react? Typically, it is to offend. It is to put someone down. Or it is to get even. Or it is to try to fix the situation. That's what Peter did. And Peter's flesh was in control. 
See how this adversity reveals our spiritual development. That's the scale we're standing on. And that's also why um, I think James says in James chapter 1, Consider it all joy, my brethren, whenever you uh, face various trials, various adversities. Everybody's going to stand on a different scale because they're, they're, there's all kinds of adversity. But then he says this, knowing that the testing of your faith, so now you're standing on the scale, and what is it revealing? It's revealing the level of your faith. And whenever you have unbelief, whenever you are not trusting the Lord, what shows up, what emotions, what inward disposition? Anxiety, worry, it could be resentment, it can be bitterness, it could be evil. That's what shows up. But whenever you're trusting the Holy Spirit, what shows up? There's peace. And then if it's in the case with people, there's kindness, there's compassion, there's forgiveness. Y'all see how this thing works? It's amazing. And here's the deal. Every single one of you are going to stand on one of these this week. That's going to be your objective opportunity to determine how you're doing spiritually. If you're growing or you're not. Either your flesh is in control or you're surrendered to the Holy Spirit. Which leads me to the 30th resolution out of Mark's gospel that I jotted down. And that resolution is pretty simple. Resolved by the Lord's leading to not allow my emotions to get carried outside of God's good purposes upon earth. That's what Peter did. Peter, Peter he went nuts, man. He went crazy, right? Man, we don't want to live that way. Now, check this out. I wish we could do this, right? Everybody with me? Don't put your stuff up. I'm not done preaching yet. Here we go. Look at me. Look at me. Eyeball to eyeball. I wish we could have a spiritual scale that you could come and stand on this morning. And you could lay it down here and be like, all right, here, 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 my turn. Here I am. Let's see how I'm doing. Oh. Oh, okay, 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 okay. I see I'm, I'm, I'm leaning over to where Jesus is. I, I see it in this portion of my life. And typically, here's the deal. Adversity is the scale. So when you face a tough time in high school, you face a tough time in college, you face a tough time at work, you face, this is it. This is the scale that you stand on. And it tells you what your emotions are. And your emotions show you who your true leader is. Now, y'all remember Peter? Come here, I promise. This is going to be awesome. Y'all ready? So Peter ended up becoming like one of the great leaders of the New Testament church. He really did. And he actually wrote some letters to the churches. And one of the letters that he wrote, check this out, he wrote it to the church that was being persecuted, that was facing great adversity. And here's what Peter said to him. He said, listen, you guys are facing adversity. He says it like this. Make sure you don't go back to living like you used to before you knew Jesus. He says, don't go back to your drunken parties, your carousing, your sensual life. Don't go back to that. Why is he saying this? Here's why he's saying it. Let's check this out. Sometimes whenever you face adversity in your life, to dull the pain of the adversity, you turn to things you shouldn't turn to. Peter knew that. For some of you, that, you, that's what you're doing. So you've got, you've got a, your marriage is all jacked up. So you know what you're doing as a, as a husband? Instead of trying to fix that with the Lord, here's what you do. You're like, you know, this is just getting ready. I'll just go get myself drunk. I'll just go online. I'll go find me another lady. Nobody ever know about it. So what are you doing? You're going back. You're living like you don't even know the Lord. You're trying to dull the pain. Whenever you do this, you know what ends up happening? Um, you get drunk. But then you get sober, and the problem is still there. Do y'all hear what I'm talking about? See, it gets pretty serious when you start thinking about it, because everybody, every one of us, every one of, all of us are going to stand on a scale this week, every single one of, and your emotions are going to be spotlighted, and it's going to reveal your spiritual development. It's going to show you who's leading. We need that to be the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Let's bow. Father in Jesus' name, thank you for your word and our time together uh, in the scripture. God, thank you for the Holy Spirit sent to us as disciples to be our help, to be our guide. And Father, I pray for those who are here this morning and they're, they're trying to numb the pain of the adversity that you've allowed to enter into their life. 
God, I pray that you would um, wake them up. Show them who you are, what you're doing, and how you'll use the adversity to strengthen their faith and to grow them. And I pray this week, Lord, that that equation, which is very simple, adversity plus emotions equals our true leader. I pray that equation will just ring in our hearts and in our lives. And as difficulty comes, help us to know how to face it. And Father, I thank you for the adversity that my family's faced and the opportunity that it's given us once again to trust you as Jehovah Rapha, the Lord who heals. And God, you have healed my wife before. Uh, you healed my uh, daughter when she should not even be born. You supernaturally worked in Krista's womb. And God, you're working now in her life. And Father, I thank you for that. And Lord, I pray that it not only would bring you glory, but also would give birth to new ministry in the days ahead to those who are suffering and going through the same uh, ordeal. And I pray for those who are hurting this morning, who've allowed their flesh to dictate their emotions and their reactions. Some who are filled with bitterness and resentment resentment and God they just need to be freed up this morning do a work in their heart and in their life with your heads bowed your eyes closed some of you are here today and you don't have a personal relationship with the Lord and so you are trying to face all of these trials all this adversity all on your own like you you, you don't have the Spirit of God to help you and the Bible says um, that we've all sinned and fallen short of God's standard none of us deserve to have a relationship with him but my, how much God loves us is pretty amazing, right? God loves us so much that he demonstrated in this that while we were yet sinners, Jesus Christ died for us. Jesus died on the cross for your sin as your substitute. He was buried and raised again. And now the Bible says if you'll turn from your sin and trust Jesus, you can have a new relationship with him. You can have the Spirit of God living on the inside of you, helping you, guiding you into the truth. So if you need that this morning. There's a lady last hour who gave her heart to the Lord. She needed the Lord. And some of you are letting your pride take you to hell because you won't humble yourself and just admit you need the Lord. So do it no longer. Come to Christ this morning. Most important decision you'll ever make. If you need to know him, just pray something like this. Lord, I'm a sinner. I know Jesus died for me and was raised again. So today I'm turning from my sin and placing my trust in you. And I want to walk with you from this day forward. And I want to be unashamed of who you are. With your heads bowed, your eyes closed, if that's the prayer of your heart and you want to give your life to Jesus or you just prayed with me or have in the past, first step of obedience is baptism. We'd love to set that up for you. So in a moment, we'll stand to our feet and as we sing, I'm going to invite you to come forward. I'll be here in the front. Other pastors, we want to pray for you, help you along in your walk with Christ. Or God may be calling you to join this church body. You feel like this is where the Lord wants you uh, to be, uh, to partner with this fellowship, to make disciples everywhere. If that's uh, what God's calling you to do, you come. Father, we give you this time of invitation. We trust that you'll work uh, as you see fit. And that's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Let's stand to our feet. While we sing, you come if God's calling you.